Thank you, Fred. That's, that was great. Um, uh, I'm gonna, uh, what I decided to read tonight, um, but before I do that, um, I'd like to um, dedicate this reading to all the students I've had in the MFA over the last six years. So I want to thank you, and this is for you. Um, just a brief setup. I decided to read uh, not a, the new novel I was writing uh, about Germany in 1936, but from a novel I finished a while ago called Resting Places. It won the uh, 2014 Tuscany Prize and will be published sometime next year, this year. And it's about a middle-aged woman named Elizabeth who lost her 21-year-old son, Luke, in a car accident during a cross-country car trip, another road trip. He died in New Mexico, though he had told his mother and father that he was heading out to San Francisco. I need to set up a little bit because I'm reading from the middle of the novel, chapter 11. Elizabeth has had lots of questions about the facts surrounding her son's death, including inconsistencies in the police report, as well as the fact that Luke called her on the night of the accident and said he needed to talk to her about something presumably important. She didn't take the call because she was with her lover that night, which, as you can imagine, this compounds the situation and adds a great deal of, in, in addition to her confusion, a great deal of guilt uh, to the situation. She has spent the past year since her son's death drinking too much, pulling away from her husband, Zach, and obsessing about the accident. She has tried to piece together where he went on his trip using credit card receipts and reviewing his phone records and calling people he contacted and might have talked to in his last few days. Based on a chance encounter with a stranger she met along the highway, and that's a chapter I read a couple of years ago, Elizabeth has decided to draw, drive country, cross country following the route her son took out to New Mexico, hoping to understand more about her son's death. Uh, she's also stopping uh, at various descansos, dis which is the Spanish word for resting places. And those are those roadside memorials uh, that you see everywhere. The last few years of her life, she and Luke had not been, uh, had been at odds. Uh, he had been distant and moody and sullen. And as chapter 11 opens, she has been on this road trip for a couple of days, and she had left in the middle of the night. She, she leaves from Connecticut, right around this area, in fact. The previous night to this chapter from the motel room where she stayed, Elizabeth had a troubling conversation with her husband, Zach, about Luke's death, bringing up a new and troubling possibility uh, that has recently occurred to her based on her trip. Uh, what if the accident wasn't an accident? What if he had meant to end his life? Zach told her such an idea was crazy. Why couldn't she just accept that their son's death was simply something that happened without a sinister purpose or darker meaning? In passing, he casually mentioned to Elizabeth that their son had seen his ex-girlfriend TJ that summer, and he had mentioned it to the father, and Zach mentions it to his wife. As the chapter opens, she is leaving the motel room uh, and getting ready to continue her, her journey. Chapter 11, Resting Places. The storm, having spent its fury, the morning stretched out with a haggard and introspective demeanor, like one waking after a debauched night of revelry. Leaves and branches littered the road. Debris was thrown over the parking lot, and up near the motel office, a garbage can lay overturned, a tree of brazen crows gorging themselves on its contents. As Elizabeth opened her car door, they took off, squawking vociferously. Stuck to the windshield was a newspaper flyer. She had to peel off like, a, like the skin of an onion. She picked up the highway and continued west. Her conversation with Zach the previous night returned to her. You're grasping at straws, he said. Perhaps she was. Perhaps all of this was just a matter of grasping at straws. She thought, too, of what he told her about Luke seeing TJ that summer. Had her son started dating her again? There was that one brief phone call Luke had made to TJ when he, while he was on the trip. It was odd that these seemingly inconsequential and desperate facts surrounding her son appeared to have such significance now, such import and nuance. They were like the dots she felt she needed to connect in order to understand the picture surrounding his death. Elizabeth warned herself not to do what she was contemplating. But lately, she hadn't heeded her own warnings. Lately, warnings seemed, seemed made for, for others. She felt reckless and irresponsible, her only law being whatever would illuminate Luke's end. 
She took her, out her cell phone and looked up TJ's number. After several rings, the young woman's familiar voice came on. Hi, this is, T this is Tess. I'm not here right now, but leave a message and I'll call you back. Ciao. Elizabeth was surprised to hear her use her first name instead of her initials. In fact, she wasn't even sure what the J stood for. She had always just been TJ. The voice brought back a painful flood of memories of the girl who used to sit in the den with Luke, eating pizza, watching TV, or studying for a test with her son, her girlish laughter fluttering in the air, filling the house with joy. She missed TJ, missed even more how her son used to act when he was around her, happy, carefree, vibrant with life. Elizabeth hadn't seen the girl in nearly two years. She'd run into TJ's mother at the dry cleaners in town a few months before. It was an awkward meeting. They both smiled too much, and Mrs. Pearson acted as, as if Elizabeth was 80 and hard of hearing. She spoke too loudly and rested her hand patronizingly on Elizabeth's wrist. When Elizabeth asked how TJ was doing, the woman said her daughter had gotten a job up in Boston at the Fine Arts Museum. Now, when it came time to leave a message, Elizabeth thought, no, this is all wrong. Why disturb the poor kid needlessly bringing up such past sorrow? Elizabeth hung up without saying anything. That day, she drove the length of Tennessee, a seemingly endless parallelogram of rolling hills, cattle and horse farms, shimmering lakes dotted with homes, and massive tourist, tourist signs advertising the likes of Forbidden Caverns, Opryland, Graceland, Gatlinburg, the Johnny Cash Museum, the Jack Daniels Distillery, and Baptist Church after Baptist Church. One sign in particular caught her attention. Set off the highway along the, a sloping pasture populated by black Angus cattle, it proclaimed simply, inexplicably, when you die, you will see God. Beneath the words appeared what seemed to be a spiky red EKG line, jumping up and down with life until finally flatlining under God's name, presumably indica indicating death. Like the life insurance sign she'd seen the first night on the road, this one too seemed a hard sell technique <coughs> of the most overbearing kind, though she wasn't sure what was being marketed other than simple fear. She passed signs for small towns with hoking sounding names like Crab Orchard, Helen's Gap, Carthage Junction, Horse Corners, Bear Hollow. She listened to the lulling twang of more country stations while drinking Red Bull to stay awake and munching on trail mix. Around two, she stopped and filled up with gas and bought a dry as cardboard sandwich at a convenience store to blunt the dull call of hunger. The storm had ushered in its way cooler, drier weather. She could smell the change in the air, a clean, sharp odor like ammonia. Sometime later, she found herself passing through a broad valley framed by low humpback hills in the distance and immediately on either side of the interstate, green pastures plowed over fields and occasional stand of pine woods. Twilight was coming on fast. Some cars in the opposite lane already had their, ha their lights on and she was reminded to turn hers on as well. She thought again of what Zach had told her, how Luke had seen TJ that summer. Maybe the girl had some inkling of where her son's mind was, what he was thinking before he died. <coughs> Elizabeth decided not to heed her earlier warning. If there was the slightest chance TJ could shed some light on her son, she would take it. She didn't want to leave any stone unturned. So she called again and got the recording. This time, though, she left a message. Hi, TJ, she said. She didn't use tests. That wasn't the girl she knew. <coughs> it's Mrs. Gerlacher, Luke's mom. How are you? She paused for a moment, then added, do you think you could call me when you get a chance? Perhaps if she hadn't been on the phone, perhaps if she'd been paying attention, more attention to the present, instead of poking around in the cluttered debris of the past, she'd have seen it a second earlier and had a chance to swerve out of the way to avoid the unavoidable. A sudden streak of brownish gray appeared just ahead and off to her right in the headlights periphery. It had bolted from some woods near the shoulder of the highway and appeared to fly effortlessly into the tunnel of her headlights. It was upon her, or rather, her sob and the brownish-gray object seemed to meet at the intersection of their respective tra trajectories, as if there had been some intentionality to their separate movements, an unstated agreement to be joined at exactly that point in time and space. Elizabeth felt helpless 
didn't have the slightest chance to do anything. Hit the brakes, swerve, <coughs> tense herself for the impact, utter a sound. There was a nauseating thwunk sound, a deep bone-breaking clatter as the deer's left flank collided with the right front of Elizabeth's car. She felt the jolt in her shoulder blades, then felt herself being thrown forward and her nose slamming into the steering wheel. She actually saw stars, like in the cartoons, little white pieces of light dancing in front of her eyes. And the next moment, not so much in slow motion, as in a series of distinct still frames, um, still frames, the creature was first suspended upside down over the hood of the car, antlers pointing earthward, then flattened against the windshield with an ear splitting. And finally, in the rear view, lying crumpled along the shoulder of the road. This all happened so fast, Elizabeth hadn't even had time to be frightened. Looking through a windshield that now appeared as, as if glazed over with a thick sheet of ice, she instinctively tried to steer the car toward the shoulder toward a shoulder of the road she couldn't see. Even then, she could tell something was terribly wrong. The steering wheel fought her like some sort of headstrong beast, felt as if it wanted to keep the car going straight on down the highway, and she had to use all her strength to bend the wheel to her will. When she'd finally managed to pull the car to a bumpy stop on the shoulder, she sat there for a moment, trembling, her heart wrapping fiercely in her chest. Now she had time to be afraid. Damn she cried at last. Recovering her wits, she got out and stood, her head spinning slightly, then went around to the front of the car. With the light from her phone, she saw that the right front fender was stove in, the bumper and grill crumpled, the headlights smashed, and the assembly dangling like an enucleated eye. Her car appeared as if it had tangled with a Mack truck rather than a single frightened deer. It was only then that she became aware of a throbbing in her head, she reached up and touched the bridge of her nose. The nose itself was mostly numb, but when she removed her hand, her fingers were covered with something slippery and dark. She was bleeding. Walking back to the car, she glanced up the highway and saw in the headlights of the oncoming tra traffic the still, lifeless form of the deer lying stretched out along the shoulder. She thought of heading back and seeing to the poor creature. Though viewing its broken and bleeding form up close would probably be the last straw. She couldn't bear that. So instead, she got in her car, avoided looking in the rearview mirror. God, what would she give for the pint of Cuddy Sark to be waiting for her in the glove compartment right now? She dialed the AAA number. I just hit a deer, she exclaimed to the operator, shaking. First things first, the woman said. She had a high-pitched, twangy accent and a smoker's raspy voice. Are you all right, ma'am? Mostly, yes. Is the vehicle drivable? I don't think so, I don't know. The operator took Elizabeth's information and where the accident occurred, and then she told her she'd have someone out there as soon as, she, as possible. But we're awful busy tonight, ma'am, on account of the storm yesterday. I'm out in the middle of nowhere, Elizabeth explained to the woman, and it's going to be dark soon. Like I said, we'll have somebody out there as soon as we can, the woman advised. In the meantime, y'all wanna lock your doors and stay in the car, and don't talk to strangers. Don't talk to strangers, Elizabeth thought as she hung up. <laughs> Yet she went ahead and locked the doors and sat way up in the seat to look formidable to any would-be attacker. For company, she listened to the radio. When Freddie Fender's wasted days and wasted nights came on, Elizabeth couldn't fail to appreciate the irony. She'd been waiting there for nearly an hour when, the f when her cell finally rang. Jesus, it's about time, she cried, ready to give the tow truck guy a piece of her mind. Mrs. Gerlacher? A hesitant female voice replied. Immediately she recognized it. Oh, TJ, I'm sorry, I thought you were someone else. How are you, Miss Gerlacher? I'm fine, Elizabeth replied. Well, not so fine, actually. I've just been in a, a car accident. Oh my goodness, are you okay? Yeah, I just hit a gear. I'm waiting for the tow truck. <coughs> the conversation struck Elizabeth as peculiar. Here she just killed a deer, was stranded along some highway in Tennessee, and now she was talking to her dead son's girlfriend ex-girlfriend. Can I do anything, TJ asked, and call anybody for you? No, I think I'm all set. The tow truck should be here any minute. Thanks for getting back to me so quickly. Your mom says you're living in Boston now. Yes, working at the Fine Arts Museum. That sounds exciting, Elizabeth said. Not really. Not unless you consider leading first grade tours exciting, she said with a self-deprecating laugh. The laugh was so familiar, Elizabeth had an image of her sitting on the couch with her son. 
her sandy blonde hair tied in a loose ponytail, her hand touching Luke's flannel shirted arm, the first girl her son lived, perhaps the only girl. Still, it's a start, and Boston's a great city to live in, Elizabeth offered. It's a lot more exciting than Garth's Point. Another laugh to which Elizabeth joined in nervously. Laughing caused her nose to ache. You go by Tess now, huh? Yeah, sort of. It sounds more professional, but you still can call me Tess. So how are you? I'm good, the young woman replied. Busy. This was followed by a pause, awkward and weighty, which made Elizabeth wonder if she were debating whether or not to tell her something. Finally, T.J. blurted out, I'm engaged. Oh, Elizabeth exclaimed, feeling a shock akin to cutting oneself while chopping vegetables. That moment of utter surprise followed a few seconds later by the stabbing pain. It shouldn't have hurt as much as it did, but it did. Another death, as if yet another part of Luke, a piece of his future, had just been erased. She recalled then how the girl's mother had seemed evasive when T.J. Had, had been brought up. Had she not wanted to be the one to tell her about the engagement? Elizabeth managed to recover quickly, though. That's wonderful. Anyone from town? No, I met him in college. Greg, that's his name. Wow. Congratulations. So when's the big day? We haven't set a date yet. We're not in any rush. No sense in rushing into things, Elizabeth says. That's great news. I'm so happy for you. And she was. Happy for her, that is. She had always loved TJ, like a daughter, in fact, the one she'd never had. But in the next moment, Elizabeth found herself wondering just where that had left TJ and Luke. Zach had said they'd gotten together several times the summer before their senior year, the summer Luke died. Had this future husband of hers, this Greg, been in the picture then? Had TJ been considering getting back together with Luke and it was only his death that put an end to their renewed relationship and allowed her to begin another one? Elizabeth could recall how devastated TJ had appeared at the funeral, how much Luke's death death seemed to affect her. How tragic that would have been if they'd finally gotten together, back together again, only to be separated by his sudden death. And now TJ, her one-time future daughter-in-law, the potential mother of her grandchildren, was going to marry someone else. Elizabeth had all she could do not to start bawling. She clenched her jaw. Don't, she said to herself. Don't put that on TJ. It wasn't her fault. God, what was she thinking contacting the girl? Elizabeth contact, contemplated making up some excuse for not wanting to talk, for wanting to talk, perhaps saying she was simply interested in finding out what T.G. was doing. After all, the girl had been such a large part of her son's life, not to mention hers and Zach's for so many years. But then again, Elizabeth had to admit she was curious. If T.J. and Luke had started to date again, why hadn't he spoke to his mother? And if something had started up again between the two, Perhaps it was somehow related to what he had wanted to tell Elizabeth that night. More dots to be connected, more pieces of the puzzle. The reason I called, I, I wanted to ask you something about Luke, Elizabeth said. Sure, Mrs. Gerlacher. The night he died, he called me. He left a message on my phone saying he had something important he wanted to tell, talk about. But unfortunately, we never got the chance. Oh, that's terrible. Yes, it has been, not knowing what he wanted. That's why I called you. I thought you might have some clue. Outside on the highway, the traffic roared by. Elizabeth's car shuddering in the wake of every vehicle that passed. The noise making it sometimes difficult to hear TJ's soft voice. Me, TJ said. I mean, you and Luke were so close. Well, we were, but not for a while. Hadn't the two of you started seeing each other again? What? My husband said Luke told him that the two of you had gone out a few times that summer. We didn't really go out, Mrs. Gerlacher. We saw each other a few times, hung out a little together as friends. So you two weren't back together? Me and Luke? She replied with a fluttery little laugh that struck Elizabeth as condescending. No. Elizabeth touched her nose and felt blood on her fingers, cool and slippery to the touch. May I ask you a personal question? Sure, I guess so, TJ said, but her tone was tentative. You and Luke always seem so good together, Elizabeth said. I even thought you'd guys get married someday. Me too, Miss Gerlacher. Then what happened? <coughs> TJ was silent for a moment, yet over the noise of the highway, Elizabeth thought she caught a faint sniffling sound coming from the other end of the phone. I'm sorry, TJ, Elizabeth offered. I probably shouldn't have brought it up. No, it's, it's all right. It's just that I get so sad whenever I think about Luke. I really liked him. 
Then, like an unwelcome confession for which she felt guilty, she added, loved him, actually. And he really loved you, TJ. Not really. What do you mean, not really? He loved me as a friend, TJ said. As a friend? My God, Luke was head, head over heels about you. No, Mrs. Gerlacher. It was the other way around. I was the one crazy about your son. Always was, ever since, like, sixth grade. Right then, Elizabeth heard the intrusive beeping of another phone call. Could you hold for a minute, TJ? That's probably the tow truck, of course. Hello, Elizabeth said to the other caller. Ma'am, our truck is running a little late, the same woman's voice drawled. It's been an hour already. He'll be there just as soon as he can. Elizabeth clicked back to TJ. Sorry about that. I'm a little confused, TJ. If you were so crazy about my son, why did you break up with him? Me, she said, her voice incredulous. Luke was the one who didn't want to go out anymore. But I was under the impression you didn't want to go out with him, that you wanted to date other people. Who told you that? Luke. That's not true, Mrs. Gerlacher. He was the one who broke it off with me. God, I cried for weeks. Elizabeth sat there for a moment, trying to digest the information. She felt the dull throbbing emanating from where she'd hit her nose, radiating, radiating back into her skull. It seemed to pulsate there like another heartbeat. Why would Luke have lied to her? Why didn't he want her to know that he was the one who initiated the breakup? It didn't make sense. She thought of simply dropping the whole thing, saying goodbye to TJ, wishing her luck in her new life, and letting the past sink down into oblivion. Instead, though, Elizabeth asked, why would he lie to me like that, TJ? I don't know, Mrs. Gerlacher. But it's so odd. Yes, it is. So you're saying Luke ended it? That's right. Elizabeth's phone rang again, but this time she decided not to get it. Why do you think he did that, TJ? I really don't know, Mrs. Gerlacher. But it doesn't really matter now, does it? Elizabeth knew she was right. It was what Zach had been telling her all along. What good would knowing any of this be now? They were kids. They'd split up. What was the big deal? Who broke, broke up with whom? Elizabeth shivered, feeling suddenly cold. It was completely dark out now, and sitting there on the side of the highway, she felt helpless and vulnerable. Felt like that time they tempor temporarily lost Luke in Wales during their vacation. As if, as if at the mercy of unknown and hostile forces. Stop, she warned herself, before it's too late. But something in her, a need both perverse and yet inexorable, compelled her forward. It matters to me, TJ. I don't think he was interested, she said, pausing, in having a relationship anymore. You mean with you? With anyone, really. I felt Luke pulling away for a long while. Was it somebody else, Elizabeth said, another girl? I don't think so. He didn't seem to be interested in women anymore, not in that way. In what way, Elizabeth said, feeling a hot pressure building in her throat? Sexually, TJ said. What are you saying, TJ? He didn't seem to be interested in me in that way. Are you saying that my son was gay? I'm not sure. What do you mean you're not sure, Elizabeth cried, anger and bewilderment leeching into her voice. Elizabeth thought she heard a, a voice whisper in the background of the phone, a young man's voice. Who is that? Was that her fiancé, the Greg who had replaced her Luke? <coughs> he seemed confused, Mrs. Gerlacher. Confused? You mean about his sexual orientation? About a lot of things. But you dated him for years, Elizabeth said. Do you think he was gay? I don't know. Really? In that last year or so, I, I felt there was something different about Luke, something that had become between us. Elizabeth recalled what Luke had, Luke's one-time best friend, Griff, had told her about Luke changing, being in his own little world. How do you mean different, TJ? I don't know how to explain it. I think he was struggling with something. He talked about going away for a while. Away? Maybe joining the Peace Corps after graduation or teaching out on an Indian reservation. Peace Corps, Indian Reservation, all this came as a surprise to Elizabeth, as if Luke was a complete stranger to her, someone who had never, she had re never really known. She sucked in a mouthful of air and felt suddenly sick to her stomach. Enough, she told herself. She didn't need to hear any more. She didn't need for this to go on. She could pretend that this conversation never even took place. And yet, once started, it seemed she couldn't stop, as if her own curiosity had an irresistible momentum that carried her onward even against her will. I'm his mother, Elizabeth said defensively. How come he never said any of this to me? 
I don't know, TJ said. It just seems so odd that he would lie to me that. Are you saying Luke was a liar? I didn't say that, Miss Gerlacher. Then what are you saying? He felt he couldn't talk to you. What? He thought you wouldn't understand. Her comments felt like a slap in the face. In fact, Elizabeth felt her cheeks turn hot with embarrassment. Really? He said that? Yes. In a supercilious tone, Elizabeth said, frankly, I find all of this very hard to believe. Hurt and angered by what TJ had said, Elizabeth wanted to lash out. The lawyer in her seemed to take over. She hardened herself, slipped into a ruthless cross-examination mode. Are you going to deny the two of you were intimate, she challenged? <laughs> Mrs. Gerlacher, please. <laughs> were you? I'd rather not talk about it if you don't mind. Well, I do mind. If you're going to say, accuse my son of being gay, at least you could provide evidence, Elizabeth said, as if this were a child and she were cross-examining a hostile witness. I didn't say he was gay. I just said he, can, he seemed confused about things. And I'm supposed to just take you at your word, and my son not here to defend himself? Mrs. Gerlacher, I loved, I loved Luke. The simple invocation of her son's name and the profession of her love for him stopped Elizabeth dead in her tracks. She realized suddenly she'd overstepped any sort of decency. TJ was right. Whatever her and Luke's relationship was or wasn't, it certainly was none of her business. She took a breath. I'm so sorry, TJ. Please forgive me. It's okay. No, it's not okay. You were always a wonderful friend to Luke and to my husband and me. I had no right to say those things. Don't worry about that. I just wish things had turned out differently. They were silent for a moment. Can I ask you one more question? Sure. When you met him that summer, do you think whatever he was going through was troubling him then? Yes, I think that's why he wanted to get away. Really, yes. He talked about driving cross country to clear his head. After a while, they said their goodbyes and hung up. Elizabeth sat there feeling numbed more than anything, a kind of shell shock as if she tried to, as she tried to process all that TJ had said to her, that Luke was the one to break off the relationship, that he was confused, that he wasn't interested in women, that the trip had been a means to clear his head, that he was, as TJ put it, struggling with something. Elizabeth also felt embarrassed for how, she'd been, how cruel she'd been to TJ. She had no right to say those things to the poor kid. Yet what troubled Elizabeth most, perhaps, was the fact that Luke felt he couldn't talk to her, couldn't tell her any of this. Of course, if he had been gay, she'd have still loved him. She'd have loved him that, no matter what. That wasn't the issue. But if he were gay, and that was still a big if to Elizabeth's mind, why hadn't she known? How could he be so utterly incomplete? How could she be so utterly and completely in the dark about her son's sexual orientation? Wouldn't she, shouldn't she, have seen clues strewn along the way? How could a mother have missed such an enormous part of her son's life? And how could Luke have managed to keep something that huge a secret from her and Zach all those years under the same roof? If it were true, what sort of mother had she been that he didn't trust her enough to be able to place in her care something so essential, so crucial to who he was? At the same time, it would have explained certain things, the distance she felt in her son, that inward turning she had sensed in Luke. God, she thought, she'd been such a fool for going on this trip, for opening up this terrible can of worms. Thank you. This novel, I'll, I'll be, try to be brief, this novel started out a number of years ago by stopping at those uh, memorials, those descansos, those uh, roadside memorials. I stopped at <coughs> dozens and then later hundreds and would get out and go up to and, and look at what those things said. How many people have done that? Stopped? You should do it sometime. Uh, some are just very simple stones, some have whole histories and stories, and part of this story is her going cross country and looking at these things, and, and as I did that, I started to understand the grief of a mother, or of anybody, a father, a son, a, you know, anybody. I, there was one, the very first one I stopped at was in New Hampshire, and I it was in a back road, and I pulled off, and I had seen it a bunch of times, and I finally stopped, and <clears throat> there was all this 
you know, debris, uh, flotsam, um, presents, uh, gifts, t tokens of, of a person's love. And there was something from a son to a father and a mother to the son. And it was a young man in his 30s. And there was a picture laminated on his post. And I started to feel what, what grief was there, you know, in, in this context. So. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I wanted some distance from me, mm -hmm. and um, and I, you know, I, what I tell writers sometimes you don't take the easy choice. You take one that's going to be more interesting. Yeah. Well, um, there, there's, I'm making a number of changes in chapters 1 through 10, including <laughs> <laughs> And the construction's not quite done yet. Um, <coughs> the movers are still coming. Now, there are a couple of chapters I could have read, but I, th I thought there's a, there's a chapter, I think it's chapter 2 now, and I have read that chapter. Some of the faculty here have been here for a couple of years, heard me tell that chapter, where she stops uh, early on in the novel, where she stops and sees a man at the side of the road and it's pouring rain and she's not quite sure what he's doing and she stops um, before she has even an inkling that she's going to go on this trip to where he died and she sees this man and she gets out of the car and he's in the pouring rain and she gets out and before she gets right up to him she sees he's kneeling and praying in the rain to one of these roadside memorials. Mm -hmm. I've read that chapter and I just didn't want to read that chapter again. That would have been an easier chapter because there's a lot less that happens before that. There would be a lot less explanation but I've read that before and I wanted to test this one out. So. So this is, a, this is a, uh, a revised chapter that has been in the works for a long, it's been there for a long time. The, the book is finished, I'm just making some revisions. So. Yeah. Um, how did you structure, how is the novel structured, like just chapter Road trip. Um, no, no, this yeah. is really interesting that we're having this. Well, the excursive. <laughs> um, it is, it here, it's, it's after, uh, the first 100 pages is, are, are about her home in this Connecticut town. She's a, she does a lot of uh, pro bono work with uh, a, a, uh, an island off the coast of uh, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she does pro bono work for, uh, for somebody. She works with women. And, um, and then she meets this man. She's, it, I, I established how distant she is with her husband. And, and then the, the background. And she meets this man again. And she's got tr tr problems at work. She has problems with her husband. And after meet, having two meetings with this man she met along the roadside, she decides to go cross country. And, and she's going to go to the spot where he died in New Mexico. And I you know, talk about research, I did that. I drove cross country. I followed the route that she would be, take, would be taking. I took hundreds of pictures and went out to this little desert town in northern Mexico. And um, that's where her son died. And there was a reference earlier, the prologue. Um, I was thinking about cutting it, but the, the editors really liked it five-page prologue where Luke is a five-year-old boy and they go on a trip from England to, to uh, uh, from Wales to Ireland on that midnight ferry, if you've ever been over there. And when they get out, they misplace him. He gets lost for a few minutes and it's the most petrifying moment. For 10 minutes, they've lost him. And they think, and she already jumps ahead as any parent would. He's gone, he's missing, I'll never get him again. And then they find him. And that is the kind of a threat that's gonna happen 21 or 20, uh, 15 years later. And this time he doesn't come back. He's he's been killed in a car accident. So, so at what point does the road trip begin? About page 100, and the and it's the next 250. So about 30 percent of of establishing things at home, and then the road trip. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So you read from historical fiction the other day. Um, oh yeah. You decide what what you're going to write, and, and you enjoy one more than the other. Um. My agent and my editors would very much like me to write one kind of thing, <laughs> and um, I follow my interests. And I have three historical novels, and, and um, I'm working on a histor the, this German novel set in 36, and I'm about 60%. I was almost going to read from that, um, but I, it's not finished yet. And uh, the other three or four are contemporary. My short story, I like to go back and forth. I follow whatever fi I find interesting. This story, uh, somewhere along the line, I saw these these roadside memorials, they, uh, this, these descansos, and I said, I gotta stop sometime. 
And finally, in New Hampshire was the first time. And then if you go back to the second one was at exit 80 or 81 right outside of New London. If you're going east, okay, and you look off, there's this kind of uh, cloverleaf exit, okay, and so in the middle of the cloverleaf on the right-hand exit, around 80, 81, there's this kind of stand of trees, and there are two little crosses. And one time, I had seen it coming up to Enders, and sometime later, I, I drove out here, drove off the cloverleaf, stopped, climbed a 10-foot chain link fence, went down and went up there, <laughs> sat there, took pictures, and um, you know, it, was, it was a moment of trying to understand what, what a parent would go through. And then I did that over and over and over again. Um, I, I gave a lecture uh, about a year and a half ago about the empathetic imagination, okay? There's lots of things as writers we don't know, and hopefully we will never know. But as writers, we, we can't be in all places and experience all things, but we can try to use our imagination, empathetic imagination, so you're condescending, but you're trying to understand how a parent would lose a child, or a father. We heard somebody read a you know, story about a father, a sick father today, uh, Shannon. Um, you know, and so we try to understand that. Yes? I like the parallel between the, the accident and the uh, phone conversation where she finds out something about her son that he never told her. Um, I, was, I was just curious as to how difficult was it to write that that conversation because I mean, you don't want to give too much with, you want it to sound natural. So I can't imagine, I mean, I think you must have done like multiple rewrites. Like just that. just one draft. <laughs> a, b a bunch, a bunch of times. Uh, you know, I, I talk in, in the workshop today about using dialogue, right? And, um, and, and this is the kind of the hot white center of, of fiction, you know, for me anyway, where you're, putting two characters in a moment of great intensity on the stage and letting them have at it with each other. And there's about, up until this point, there's about three or four really, I think, white hot moments where there's, there's stuff that's happening. One is with the man along this highway, one is with her husband, another is another one with the man along the highway, and then this is, there's a couple before that, but this is really important and it goes on for several, many pages. And I had to rewrite a lot of times because the facts of what I was doing changed, okay? I, it, <coughs> And this, change one thing and everything. Yeah, and, change, and, and this may actually be a red herring. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll just say that once again. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Uh, I was just wondering, you, you know, you still kind of think about yourself growing novel, novel, and maybe what you've learned through this novel, now that it's, it's almost done. What have I learned? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, you know, I, most of my novels have a, a major driving force, okay, a strong plot. I do like that. I love characterization. I love great characters. I love interesting conflicts. I love wonderful prose. But I also like a strong plot. I like, I like to be carried along on that kind of wave. And, uh, and I don't like the plot to overwhelm character. I like the plot to be strong enough, but I like the characters and the situation, the prose to be strong so that you can stop every once in a while and read passages more slowly. Um, and I guess I learned, you know, I learned to trust that you don't, I, I feel comfortable when I have a driving plot and except uh, that I had the, this kind of skeleton of a, of a road trip, it was a much more of, of a uh, eulogy, you know, where she's doing a lot of thinking on this trip before she goes and then later on. And at some point it's almost too much thinking, you know, I had to get her doing some things too. You know, she can't just sit there being thinking, you know, she's got to do something, you know. And uh, the business about the deer where she's on the phone thinking about something, or try, thinking about what, what she, whether she should be asking her son's girlfriend, who's not even his girlfriend anymore, about their past and whether they're having sex. And, you know, well, she wouldn't, didn't plan on that. She just sort of wanted, what was he feeling? And, you know, I loved him. And, we, you know, and she wanted a simple answer, and she didn't get a simple answer. And um, the business about the, the deer, I was up in New Hampshire. Um, it was right when the, the stock market was collapsing. And I'm on the phone talking to my stockbroker, and he's telling me how, he's just relax, relax, relax. I'm losing all my money. <laughs> and, and I'm trying to concentrate. I'm going through these woods. And wouldn't you know, a goddamn deer has to come running out then. <laughs> right then. Okay, well, I'm losing money. I hit him. He flies over the hood just like this. I see him out of the corner of my eye go flying back, lying there. I get out. I go back. By the time I go back, I, ha I hang up with my, my accountant. Uh, he's still trying to say, relax, relax. I just said, I hit a deer, too. <laughs> and it's your fault. 
and I go back, and the deer got up and ran into the woods. I come back to my car, and there's $5,000 damage. <laughs> yeah, so. But that was a real thing. Yeah, wow. so. I guess I learned not to trust your accountant <laughs> and watch out for deer. <laughs> yeah, so. Other questions? Any other? Any novels that serve as models for you on this one? Yeah. Um, I, I, I mentioned this in our, my, our, my class, the importance, and I think Peter mentioned it today about the importance of models. I always talk about it. I have three or four models. Um, I was reading a book called Olive, uh, Olive Kittredge. I had read it before. I went back and I reread it, and I read it almost the way you would read uh, a prayer every morning to get me into a woman's head and to get me into any head in, in a deep, complex kind of way, and not a simple way. And I. And I would read that over and over again. That didn't give me much in terms of structure, because there's structures all over the place. I have a clearer structure to this book. Um, but that was one of them. Yeah. Anything else? How about one? Huh? Is, was there, a, it's not really about writing, did you find a commonality in these books, consoles? Were they mostly younger people? Or, uh, you know, so therefore kids? Yeah. Uh, um, at one point she says, uh, either right before this chapter or right after, I forget, she said, either as she drove south, they were much more reckless drivers or much more uh, religious, because mm -hmm. they were everywhere, and they were. And uh, starting in Virginia and certainly through Tennessee and through many through Arkansas, tons through Texas and New Mexico, I think the Catholic influence is, uh, is pronounced, and I think it's one aspect of it. Uh, but you'd see hundreds, and after a while, I was going with a buddy of mine uh, across country, and we'd stop, and we'd stop, and we'd stop, and then we'd, st we'd stop stopping at every one. We'd look at ones that are pretty interesting. I'll just give you a couple. There was one in, um, in New Mexico, right outside of Roswell. And there was this cross, and it was on a bob next to a barbed wire fence. There was a guitar, a couple of guitars. There was uh, like a field hockey stick, and it was a picture of this beautiful Hispanic girl, uh, you know, sort of laminated and nailed to the fence post. And all these flowers and all this stuff and you know little, little, little Madonnas and and um, Pietas. In fact, there's one scene where there's a in another scene there's a small little Pieta in one of these things. And she talks about a mother holding her dead son in her arms. And she said, "Why didn't I hold my son in the morgue when I saw him?" And she re feels great regret for not doing that. So in, in this one, it was really funny. I, I saw all this stuff and I got on when we stopped. Uh, online, and I Google, and it came up, and this young woman was like 19 or 20, and she was killed, but she was the one who killed five other people, and they didn't have a disconso, only she had disconso, so that was this great irony, and then there was this other one, I'll just say one more, um, there were these two crosses, and I talked, I talked about the research, these were things found, and said, here Michael, take them, use them in your book. I saw two, two uh, uh, crosses, one bigger and one smaller. And there was a name of one with a last name and a birth date and a, and a death date. And then the little one had a death date. Oh. And being a man, and two men were standing there and going, hmm, what's that? Hmm, what's that? And suddenly a light went off and I said, oh my God. And I said, I gotta use this. So I took pictures of it. I have the pictures. I could share all these pictures if anybody wants to see this stuff. There was one story after another. In fact, uh, she, the man she sees along the highways, his name is George Doucette. And he says to her, you know, you should do this. I, I stop at a lot of these, not just my wives, because there are all this, there's these stories. You should do it. When I stop at another discansus, I feel connected to my dead wife who was killed here six years ago. And so I do this, and I go and I stop, and I'll sometimes light a candle at somebody else's roadside memorial. Okay, and I'm not a religious guy, but this was very touching. And to see that there was a fetus died at this point, and somebody named this fetus, and somebody put the things in after this. And then, by the way, right, oh, one, one last one. Right outside of New Haven, there was, there was a young girl killed. And I modified it, and uh, I changed it. And I thought, and there was one cross that I found that had a um, concrete base with, a, with, a, with metal coming up, and it was fancy. And I thought, imagine the father, the mother down his workshop, putting this thing together, painting the name on, fixing it, you know, getting it just perfect, bringing it out there, digging the hole, putting it in, having some kind of memorial service right there along the side of the highway. And she talks about this at one point. She's there by herself. 
and she starts to build this momentum that I got to go and I have to see and she's got to do this and so she goes down there's a couple other surprises when she gets down there you know it's not a mystery novel but it's the mystery of the heart and of people in, in the world you know what the cover of your book will look like? Um, I don't know <laughs> I, I don't know I don't know um, I, I hope it's not too obviously religious but it is a but does they seem like potent images yeah, I mean, I'll, I will give the editor many of these crosses, okay? Um, these pictures of the crosses that, that I took because they're just, you know, some are just, you know, uh, heartbreaking and wonderful, run, wonderfully um, um, evocative, you know? So, yeah. Any uh, memorials that weren't Christian based? I mean, there were a couple that were just sort of, you know, stones piled on top of stones. There was one I saw in Virginia. Um, it was right after an overpass, and somebody literally took a couple of branches that they got out of the woods and took a scarf, wrapped it around this way and this way, tried to dig a hole, and then and they really there was no hole. They just put stones around, it and it was like this, and it had been there forever. It seemed, you know. Others are really fancy. You know, others are incredibly fancy. Um, but I mean, I would just sort of. You know, challenge you to just stop at one or two, and you'll see these stories. Yeah. You know, some are kind of plain, but others tell whole stories. You know, who puts stuff? Goodbye, Daddy. You know, blah blah blah. And it's you know, it's, it's it could be maudlin, of course. You know, um, like Gray's Elegy. But it, it I, I hope, I hope my book is not maudlin. But th there's a great deal of pa genuine pathos there. Other it, it, it's funny. I, I I don't have much experience seeing these crosses, but I live in North Philadelphia. And what they do, I don't know if they do that this everywhere, but they, you'll see a collection of stuffed animals. And, yeah. um, well, it's, I live in a neighborhood that's yeah. mostly Puerto Rican. And they have the uh, tall glass yeah. uh, candles that have religious um, images on them. And um, you don't get a story, but it's, it's like, it's like the same thing, but I don't know how, did you just invent the story around the cross? Because there's really well, no, there. Well, there, if you look, I saw many, that they tell a story. I, I, another example, in Kansas, uh -huh. there were four crosses all together. And there were two bigger ones and two smaller ones. I, I could show you the pictures. And the one bigger one, one smaller one had the same name. One bigger one, smaller one had the same name. Uh, there were two brothers and two brothers. So four kids were killed at this one spot here. And I looked it up, and I looked up the, the accident. You, I, you, know, just, you did a search. I had the names. Mm -hmm. I did a search, and yes, they, were, they got hit by a truck. There's never any information on the stuff that I find. Though. It's like a, a pile of soggy yeah. Sometimes, and, Sometimes you'll just see teddy bears or some kind of small thing. You know, most that I've seen that I stopped at had a cross, had some kind of cross, mm. sophisticated or uh, rudimentary, uh, but some kind of cross. Yeah. One more question? Eh? What did you title your book? What did I title? It's called Resting Places, which is the Spanish for, uh, it's the English for descansos. Uh -huh. and, and so. Thank you.